before I start this uh, presentation, let me give you a little context. Uh, this project is, um, I started this project, it is like a pet project for me. Um, I know we have funding, I'm sure, we, we echo with this, uh, this personal experience of mine. We always have our own pet projects and then we have funded projects. So this project basically I started in 2012, but, uh, but uh, more seriously from 2013. And I had to finish it in 2015 because I had some other fund and the funder gave me a threat, you must finish it and start the project. So I started in 2012, had to finish in 2015, and I had several funding for this project. Uh, and I ought to thank them because now it's live. Number one, uh, the project was funded by Leicester's Research Development Fund. It was also funded by Leicester's Professional Development Innovation Fund. It was also funded by Hokkaido University's Fieldwork Fund. And lastly, it was funded by Kansai University um, uh, Visiting Research Fellow Position. So there are four different funders who are involved in this project. So although it is a pet project, but uh, uh, my pet project was loved by various other institutions at different phases of this, uh, this three, four years. And um, although the fundings were small, but they were significant. They helped me to do what I wanted to do. Uh, so yeah, there you go. So. Um, um, I'll try my best, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I did not manage to look into everybody's profile uh, in this research centre, but what I understand from LOPA is that you all are involved in international projects, so um, I hope you know, my project will make some sort of sense uh, with the kind of work, I'm sure wonderful work that is ongoing at CAWR. Um, okay, so with that note I'm going to start because I know that I have to finish it in last time. Okay, so. Um, as you could see, uh, the title, Avoidable Deaths, a case for soft systems failure approach to disaster risk reduction. This is something new that I started uh, developing when I joined Leicester University. You know, my background has been in sociology of disasters, but not into systems thinking. So then I moved into school of business, so I was in a way forced to develop a new, new area, new expertise, which I quite enjoyed it. I tried to bring those uh, systems thinking in our disaster risk reduction field. So uh, yes, it, it, is, it is something new uh, and uh, it is something that I'm also applying uh, in disaster risk reduction, which is also new. So yes, so the two new things, and I've tried my best to see uh, this, this, this emerging topic on avoidable deaths. Okay, um, Lopa, if you don't mind. Yeah, 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 sure. yeah, sure. yeah thank you. So, okay. Um, so the, to begin with, you know, let me give you the problem and the scale uh, it, it, within the context of natural disasters. So when there is any kind of a disaster, be it flood, cyclone, drought, or tsunami, there are two things we, we often hear in the television. Uh, you would see either there is a, there's a huge injury or human loss. Okay? And some of the examples are Indian Ocean tsunami where more than 100,000 people died. And then again, the Great East Japa and Japan the total earthquake, more than 15,000 people died. And then later on in Typhoon Haiyan, again in a more than 6,000, and Nepal earthquake, which is the most recent one, again more than 7,000 people died. So, you know, um, we often hear this kind of uh, news that, that um, people die in thousands. And you will also find there's a difference between the death, between developed and developing countries. Sadly, the developing countries bear the, br the brunt of this kind of disasters. Okay, and um, my, in my research location, which I will show you in the next slide, which is Orissa, um, there was a cyclone in 1999. Okay, and more than 10,000 people died. <coughs> and I will, I will get back to that uh, slide uh, 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 shortly, that why you know, the Orissa had such a huge casualty. So in light of this, um, this the death, death data that, that we come across, I, I wanted to ask that uh, why actually people die in disasters? why somebody dies, and why death occurs in disasters. So, the next slide, is, this is about um, uh, Orissa, where I tried to um, understand the, the problem, and I used Orissa as a case study. Now, in 1999, Orissa was affected by a super cyclone, uh, and Orissa is just here, in the, and it sits on the coast of Bay of Bengal, and Orissa is very, very prone to cyclone, drought, floods, because it also has a very, very complex river system, so it gets flooded recurrently, almost every year. In 99, Orissa actually caught the international line light because 10,000 people died. And 99 also is very important for me because I went to Orissa. I'm not a warrior person, 
but I come from a different parts of India. I usually come from West Bengal. I'm from West Bengal. And when, in 1999, I was in Mumbai. Over here, I was doing my MA in social work at Tata Institute of Social Sciences. And more than 10,000 people died, and the government was looking for volunteers. So I went to Orissa, that was my first experience, and I, I acted as a relief worker with the government. And that experience led me to uh, develop my research proposal, and which was later on funded by Ford Foundation, and I did my PhD in the Department of Sociology at Warwick University, uh, which I completed in 2006, and I after my PhD in 2007. So, 1999, you know, it was, a, it was the tail end of the disaster risk reduction, a um, uh, decade of international disaster risk reduction, which is from 1990 to 2000. And this decade was declared by the UN, and they wanted to reduce death. And it happened in 1999, and it caught really international life. And Orissa, um, and everybody got really interested that why there were 10,000 people. And then later on, when I started my research project, this particular research project, in May 2013, again, I was lucky at the same time, maybe not uh, unlucky, the Oriya people were unlucky, they experienced similar kind of cyclone, you know, cyclone for you, you could see 160 miles per hour, the magnitude and the scale, more or less same. And the government was able to reduce the death from 10,000 to 86. So Orissa became a, an important case for me. So I really wanted to understand why there were 10,000 people in 1999. You know, why 10,000 people died, and how come the government managed to reduce death to 86. And this is very important, although the magnitude and the scale of these two disasters are different, but the disaster management system was really, really challenging in both these contexts. And, more importantly, Odessa is a very small state, Indian, small Indian state, relative to other big states. And number two, Odessa is a poor state. Okay, and, uh, and in 2005, the Odessa's Orissa's Human Development Report declared Orissa as a food insecure region and partly due to natural disasters. So for a poor state like Orissa to achieve such a remarkable uh, success in reducing death uh, caught again international attention you know, from the UN as well and, uh, and including myself. So, so it was very interesting. It was, it was, I was very curious to find out what is it exactly that the government did. Okay, so before I do that, I'll take you, talk you through some of the concepts that I try to uh, develop in order to understand why people die and how we can reduce death. Okay, so that's the title of my book, which is currently under review with Springer. So, avoidable death. So, I, I try to, I, my argument is that actually the deaths that happen in disasters, most of the time, can, we can avoid them. And we can avoid them partly because uh, we had tremendous um, success in terms of um, science and technology. The early warning systems have advanced uh, dramatically. So, and also, according to Amartya Sen and others, that we have got so much wealth that we, we are able to reduce death. Okay, and yet, deaths continue to happen. So the question is, you know, why, why do we have debt and, and what these avoidable deaths are? So, um, I understand avoidable deaths are basically preventable deaths. These deaths can be reduced. And um, when avoidable deaths continue to happen, uh, you would find that Gao Tung and others, they say, actually violence is being created. And also, according to Amartya Sen, uh, when violence is committed, it's partly because that the actors and the organizations who are involved in, in managing or mitigating disaster risks have somehow failed failed to do the actions that they were supposed to do. When that happened, um, uh, the violence continues to uh, go on. And also, Paul Farmer, I don't know whether you're aware of, a uh, medical anthropologist, and he says, uh, when avoidable deaths continue to happen, they're basically stupid deaths. They can, they, we can, and we have the measures to, uh, to reduce such stupid deaths. And also, according to Amartya Sen, his preventable deaths uh, when they continue to happen despite all the resources, actions, and the knowledge uh, that we have, uh, they are basically intolerable, in, 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 intolerable injustice. Uh, it's partly because injustice, be, injust, injustice is being done to the individuals uh, who could have been either evacuated prior to the disaster or could have taken to the proper emergency shelter, but somehow the government didn't manage to do. And, and it continues to happen. 
uh, not just in, in developing countries, also many a times in develop, developed countries. I mean, last year I had the opportunity to go to Hiroshima and, and I did conduct a field work for a month in Hiroshima. In 2014, <coughs> Hiroshima had a landslide and 76 people died. And it was surprising for a country which is so developed, developed <laughs> economically, socially and technologically, I and mean, yet 76 people die. So it's not just happening only in the developing world, but also, uh, you know, there are instances that, that happens in the developed world. And we all know America is another example uh, where uh, uh, during the time of Hurricane Katrina, we had a very high number of death toll. So um, th these are some of the arguments that I've tried to bring in from, uh, from, from the developmental economics uh, and, um, and theories of violence to understand how when deaths continue to happen, uh, the violence, these are very, this violence are, you know, in a way, in the context of disasters are even to violence because the violence has been commenced there, commenced there and then because the actors were involved in uh, mitigating, um, mitigating risks uh, on individuals and communities somehow have failed. So according to Amartya Sen, so what do we do when, there, when the intolerable injustice continues to happen? He tries to provide three solutions. Number one is high priority. So the high priority, what he means is that the disaster management system should somehow prioritize reducing death. Currently, that, that prioritization, the high prioritization system is lacking. Number two is goal. So somehow the government or the disaster management sh system should come up with a goal, a goal which is like an overall objective to bring different actors and organizations together to say, hey, we want to reduce death. And that should be our motto and mission statement. And I will be able to show you how these, some of these, these, uh, these, um, you know, these theoretical uh, components were manifested in the context of Orissa in 2013, where the government managed to reduce death to 86. And, and lastly, uh, Amartya Sen talks about accountability. Currently, the accountability system is emerging in the context of disaster risk reduction. <coughs> I'm working with UNISDR. I'm developing one. I'm co-authoring, actually. Co-authoring well, one of the Sendai's. I do not. I hope you all are aware of Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. Uh, no, the so Sendai framework is something like the Sustainable Development Goals. So you know, so the Sustainable Development Goals is an international framework where all the UN member states have to use it when they are trying to practice and implement development. Likewise, for our disaster risk reduction people, we have something called Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. It is an international framework. Uh, and uh, more than 185 countries have ratified it. And it is, again, the time uh, scale of this Sunday framework is 2015 to 2030. And I was able to take part in the Sendai framework. I also played a key role in providing an input into the Sendai framework. Uh, Sendai is in Japan. I, I, I was also in Japan in 2015 when this, this international framework was ratified by more than 185 countries. So accountability, accountability system is currently lacking in disaster reduction. We don't have a, a, a thing called accountability. If, if a government fails to protect or evacuate people, there is no way you could penalize them. Because the disaster management system is not based on right-based approach. You know? uh, so uh, as a result, you would find many a times this, this, the national governments ratify these sustainable development goals or the disaster risk reduction framework. But if they don't do, the UN or the UN ISDR cannot penalize, penalize the national government or the state government, or, or the government below the state government. So, th so accountability is really, really new. And we are now trying to develop an accountability guideline for Sendai framework, which we will try to pass it on to the, to the EU member states and see whether it works or whether it will work. Maybe not, but, you know, but it's a start. OK, so uh, that, that, you know, I am using this avoidable debt lens to understand uh, and, and also conceptualize um, the, the, the way um, the, the, uh, the death can be reduced and death can be avoided uh, in resource poor context. So uh, the nation doesn't have to be fully developed and, uh, so, uh, and yet uh, the, the poor nations such as Orissa, India, Bangladesh or other parts of South Asia or in Africa, they can reduce death, you know. Uh, but we need to bring in the concept of avoidable death to understand how we can do it and how actions, inactions uh, can be uh, improved and how skills and expertise can be improved by bringing the lens of avoidable death and violence and intolerable, intolerable injustice. 
But to go back to the other theory, so what is it that we know and what the people are saying why people die? These are some of the traditional theories that I have tried to bring in. Um, uh, largely spe uh, generally speaking, we have two uh, overarching theories. One is the risk, uh, and, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, some of you have come across this theory, uh, the, this perspective on, the, on risk. Uh, that's number one. Number two, the second perspective is the vulnerability perspective. But my research goes beyond these traditional theories. But before I do that, I will talk you through uh, um, briefly uh, what is this risk theory and how they try to understand why people die. Now, the risk theory is basically the mainstream theory. And this mainstream theory and this theory is largely advocated by the UN. And also, you would find this risk theory is advocated by the geographers, the natural scientists, uh, climate science, so on and so forth. For them, um, they use three, three uh, parameters to understand why people die. Number one is the intensity of a hazard. So for them, the higher the intensity of a hazard, the more likely it is to kill people. Okay, since the focus, so it, as it, it, my focus was in, in Orissa, and the government tried to give the explanation that the cyclone was, you know, unprecedented. Often we will hear that the flood was unprecedented. Often you would hear this is the flood that has happened after 100 years. You know, so the intensity. The intensity was so huge that the existing disaster management system did not manage to cope. As a result, people died. Okay, that's number one. Number two, you would find by seasonality of the hazard. Hazards are seasonal, and we would also see that human deaths are also seasonal. For example, the month of November in, in the subcontinent uh, is cyclone proof. So we have found that more than 32% of cyclones death happen in the month of November compared to other, death, other, other, other months. Uh, it's the same in the UK, the monsoon, even the flood, uh, the winter uh, monsoon is largely during the winter time, whereas uh, the monsoon uh, uh, and, and the floods and the cyclone in the subcontinent is, is from May to September. And the third one is spatial diversity. The, ge the geophysics of a hazard is specially determined. So, for example, you know, India is diverse, and we have different regions, and the different regions experience different kinds of hazards. So, for instance, the east coast of Orissa, if I take you back to my second slide, yeah, so you can find this, this, this whole coast of the Bay of Bengal, uh, we experience, um, you know, uh, cyclone floods, um, and uh, well, we don't experience tsunami, but mostly cyclone flood, heat wave, and most recently lightning. But on the west coast, you would find these areas, they, they don't experience that much of cyclone, you know, but they do experience flood, but these areas are really, really prone to drought. So according to the risk advocates, um, so the deaths are also, uh, you know, determined by the special diversity of the hazards. So these are, so you would find that the risk, risk advocates tend to use these three, three components to understand why people die. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> based on that, the UN and the other national governments tend to really focus on science and technology to reduce the, or minimize the impact of hazards on people. But I, but I think there is a problem uh, in, this, in this, um, uh, this perspective, partly because it doesn't explain, it doesn't give me the answer that I'm looking for. For example, yes, they are able to tell us based on the intensity, impact, seasonality, and the special diversity of the hazard that people die, but it doesn't tell why some people are more vulnerable than others. So you would find, you know, if we disaggregate the global disaster mortality data, we find that more females tend to die than men. Okay, so in, in, the, in, in the tsunami, Indian Ocean tsunami, 100,000 people died, but more than 70% were women. Okay? So uh, likewise, in 1991, 100,000 people died in Bangladesh, but most of them were, again, women and children. So there is a gender, a gender uh, you know, the data, when the mortality data is di disaggregated, we see different kind of, uh, of, 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 of a different kind of a scenario there. So then, then the second uh, view is on vulnerability perspective. Now the vulnerability people are able to give us some more insight uh, into why some people are more vulnerable than others. Now, this perspective has largely come from the geographers, and, and they were able to give us uh, some sort of an understanding why some people are more vulnerable than others based on some of these determinants. 
Number one is biological. So they said that men are physically stronger to withstand a cyclone or a drought or a flood compared to women. And we have found in South Asia that um, you know, often women have been drowned, uh, partly because women in, in Bangladesh wear sari, and the sari, you know, I, I, you know how to be a sari, yeah? So that, that in a way hinders you from swimming or climbing up trees so, you know, to, you know, to, um, you know, to withstand the impact of the hazard. Um, that, that's, that's, the, that's the social side, but I was talking about the biological side. That they argue that um, men are able to withstand the impact of the hazard better than a woman. And men are also able to climb up faster than a woman. And a woman with a young kid is even far more difficult for them to run, you know, when, there is, when, when they know that the, 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 the cyclone is going to make a landfall. That's number one. Number two, they also try to understand based on social vulnerabilities. And these vulnerabilities can be understood through caste, class, gender, and age. You know, in my own research in Orissa, I found, uh, if, because I studied um, uh, multiple disasters from 1999 to 2003, where I tried to see, uh, tried to understand how caste, class, and gender affects the survivability and also recoverability of the women. And, you know, uh, we found that upper caste women tend to survive, mitigate, and also recover faster compared to a woman from a low caste. And it, and it applies the same for class because in India, caste and class go hand in hand. So women who are upper caste are also rich because they are able to own lands and they have the land rights. And the women who are from low caste are very poor and they are working class because they are untouchable and sometimes they don't have rights to land. So caste, class and gender, all these things go hand in hand in the Indian subcontinent. And also in terms of age, they have found in Japan you know, um, uh, the, uh, the disasters such as the earthquake, Kobe earthquake, even the, um, the most recent one, um, um, the elderly people were badly hit. So that's the social aspect. And then the third one is on physical vulnerabilities. So the researchers have also shown that, you know, uh, for some hazards, actually the rich people are uh, more vulnerable compared to poor people. For example, in the Latour earthquake, uh, and then in 2001 earthquake, we found that people who were in shanties, people who were in slum dwellers, they were, they were not that badly affected. Whereas the people who were in concrete houses, and the con you know, earthquake don't kill people, it is the construction of the building that will kill you. So you see <coughs> then the, the, this complexity of, of understanding vulnerability is that poverty and vulnerability are, are interlinked. But poverty is not always the answer to explain why some people die and why don't. So again, it's a very interesting perspective that the vulnerability uh, advocates are able to do. And I have you know, uh, tried to understand even my problems through the lens of vulnerability perspective. So these are two dominant uh, theories that are currently around and they try to explain um, why some people die and why not, uh, and, and others don't. Now, my, um, because my research is around, uh, because I'm trying to find out why, you know, um, why people still continue to die, because the vulnerability perspective tells us that some people are vulnerable than others. But they still are not able to tell us, you know, fully why death continue to happen. So I have gone beyond this traditional and vulnerability perspectives by bringing a new perspective called, which I call it complex perspective and have tried to develop complex perspective largely based on uh, soft systems thinking. So what is this complex perspective? The complex perspective is, I'm saying is that actually deaths in a disaster are, uh, are not that simple. We really, yes, the risk perspective and the vulnerability perspectives are able to give us some explanation, but they're not able to give us entirely the, the of, uh, entire um, um, entire um, you know, view on what happens exactly uh, when somebody dies. So um, my, um, my argument is that deaths are very complex. And, and to do that, we have to use a different lens. And I try to uh, um, develop this lens of complex perspective by saying that there are vulnerabilities that exist or are at the margins of the disaster management system that has not been fully explored either by the risk people and also by the vulnerability people. So I'm saying that uh, the disaster management system is actually very, very complex. And this complexity can be understood because uh, understood through the lens of complexity. And the complexity, what it does, 
it brings in that there are a number of actors and organizations involved in disaster management system that neither the risk people nor the vulnerability people have able to uh, extrapolate it. And I try to do it with the help of soft systems thinking. And as I've mentioned that, you know, a disaster management system under, within the, of, within the uh, 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 you know, um, context of complex perspective is that it is, is actually a conglomeration of different professional groups and actors. And these actors and organizations are basically designed to do specific tasks and goals. And we are not able to understand, understand those specific tasks and goals through, from the perspective of traditional advocates and the vulnerability advocates. So when there are lots of actors and organizations involved in a disaster management system, and if they don't have good coordination and communication between them, it is likely that the disaster management system will fail. And they will fail in such a bad way, the consequence will be that they will not be able to reduce death. Okay, and as a result, um, um, I try to show this by, uh, okay, so as I was saying about that the disaster management system is a conglomeration of different professional groupings and actors, I've tried to provide, uh, give you an example very quickly, is the typology, by developing a typology, you would see organizations. So disaster management organizations are three types, we have primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary uh, organizations involve this, this number of, uh, this different kind of actors. They involve category one responders. Um, I am assuming that you, you don't know the term. Category one responders are basically, uh, uh, according to the Civil Contingency Act in the UK, are basically the gold guys. So they are basically the decision makers. You know? Um, no, I'm so sorry. This is the primary. But this is the effective company. Category one responders are the people who are directly responding in the community. That could include ambulance, police. Um, uh, and uh, in, in, in the context of India, it is a district and a village chief and, uh, and uh, the block officers. Uh, and then the secondary ones are basically the category two responders. They are the decision makers. Uh, in the context of India, they are Indian Meteorology Department, over here the environmental uh, office, uh, offices, and uh, we have disaster. There are different uh, organizations, which I will show you in the in this next slide. So category two responders are largely the decision makers and the tertiary are the global responders such as the UN, World Bank, Federation and things like that. So, you, yes, so what I was trying to say is that actually disaster management system involves lots of actors and organizations at different levels, you know, and they are specially segregated. So, um, and as a result, disaster management system is not that simple. It's quite complex. So somehow within this organization of actors, if somebody is not able to do the job they are supposed to do, uh, uh, that will have a, have a you know, domino effect all throughout. Okay, so this is an example, as I said, of the primary, secondary, and tertiary. This is the complex disaster management organization actors in Orissa. We have the Revenue and Disaster Management Department, Special Relief Organization, Orissa State Disaster Management Authority. These are all category two responders. Then we have Disaster Management Act, which came out in 2007. And that is now, the, this act was um, uh, passed by the government of India. Um, so as a result, um, the government of India also belongs to the category two responders. Then we have State Disaster Management Authority, the State Executive Committee, which is headed by the Chief Minister. He is an elected member, uh, the head of the state. These are all category two responders. Now these are actually the category one responders. And Indian Meteorology Department, is also category two responder, UNDP, NGO, UNDP is tertiary, INGOs and federations are tertiary, NGOs depends, if they are national, uh, they will be uh, in a category two. But there are so many NGOs in, in Orissa, uh, and basically um, Orissa did not have any NGOs before 1999. They had very few, only one or two, but after 99 they had more than 3,000 at the moment, you know. So lots and lots of NGOs are working. So this is the context within which the disaster management system works. And uh, what the risk and vulnerable people are not able to tell us, what happens within the system and how this system works. You know, um, are they active? Do they take decisions? Uh, you know, what, uh, if, they are, if they are being uh, passed down by the government of India or by the state government and so on and so forth. So we are not able to understand those vulnerabilities. We are not able to understand the actions and the inactions that these organizations and the actors do from the lens of vulnerability and risk perspective. So it's only the complex perspective that will allow us to do that. Now this is an interesting one. I don't know what is this. It is 
I'm sorry, just what? Just press the, the, um, the minimize button. Go to no, and then minimize it. Oh, yeah. You need to press no first. No. Mm, okay. okay, so, yeah. Um, and also, you know, uh, to really understand this complex perspective, I have developed uh, three more components. Uh, and, and to do that, um, I have tried to uh, develop another new uh, terminology, which I call it systems failure. And the systems failure is basically um, uh, from, from risk crisis theories. And I don't know whether you're aware of Charles Perrault. Charles Perrault was the first guy who tried to explain uh, why systems fail, but his failure was in the context of high risk systems. Uh, which are nuclear industries and so on and so forth. Uh, according to Charles Perrault, um, accidents happen due to human and technology error. But this human technology error wasn't understood very well, but they somehow, the organizations, if, this, if there is an accident, they will say it is an operator's or error. So the operator gets blamed that the operator didn't do the job properly, as a result there was an accident. And, and the accident happened in such a way that, you know, and he also tried to explain when, because the high risk systems are so complex, so if something goes wrong in one place, it will have a domino effect. And, and, and the mistakes will happen so fast and so rapid, then it goes beyond the human imagination. They can, cannot really understand how to sort that out. But those complexities were somehow are not um, picked, and uh, not given attention by the organizer, organizers or the managers, or the, or, the, or the executive team, but somehow somebody, an individual, gets blamed, and Charles Perry calls it an operator's error. And the second one uh, is James Reason. James Reason takes forward Perrault's uh, idea of accident and an operator's problem uh, by bringing human errors. And he talks about that, yes, in high-risk systems, the technology fails and the operator gets blamed, but there are also errors that humans, hu humans do. And then lastly, we have Decker and Shecklin. So these are some of the, well, the Decker and Shecklin also talks um, um, in the context of high risk systems to, uh, to, uh, to tell us how systems within an organization can fail when actors are not able to do their job properly. So, so based on basically soft systems thinking and the theories of risk crisis and disaster management, I have developed three uh, components of systems failure to explain uh, how the disaster management system can fail in, in not protecting human lives. Um, the three components are coordination, communication, and subjective worldviews. Uh, to really explain those three components, again, I have taken another, made another assumption, uh, is that uh, we need a point of analysis. A point of analysis to understand how coordination fails and how communication fails and how this contested and subjective worldviews come together and play a key role for the disaster management system to fail. Um, and I have to do that partly because, you know, when these actors and organizations are trying to mitigate risk and trying to implement some of the disaster management policies and programs that the central government or the UN is telling them to do, you know, it is not possible, humanly not possible to observe the things that they are doing in Orissa or in any other parts of the world. So I have to somehow, you know, come up with another assumption to see how I can really see those failures that is happening uh, during the time of disaster. So my point of analysis I uh, decided to take is something called core information. So what is core information? In simple words, core information is the early warnings. And these early warnings are basically generated by the Met Office and, and, and then um, Met Office in, in interface with technology and then the humans try to interpret uh, the intensity of the hazard. So this core information is vital for a disaster response system to function properly. If the core information is not passed on properly, there will be some problem. So for example, I have tried to explain that how this core information can get stuck in those different disaster uh, uh, organizations that the actors are involved. Number one is coordination failure. Okay, so according to comfort, you know, the core information is vital. Because core information tells you, because my hazard is cyclone, uh, for, for cyclone we need 48 hours. Especially, you know, before 48 hours, all the evacuation um, has to be completed because when within 48 hours you really can't do anything. And at that time, the response system cannot function. 
So what um, uh, Comfort is saying is that actually prior to 48 hours, the disaster management and the actors involved in uh, mitigating or, 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 or evacuating people, uh, they ought to get that information. So if that information is not reached to the actors, they will not be able to develop an effective disaster response system. So that the, 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 the great example was the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. There was no core information. There was absolutely no core information for the responders to evacuate. It just happened because there was no early warning system in place at, this, at that time. That's what one uh, great example. Number two is the communication failure. Uh, this core information can actually get stuck in different contours of different organizations. Number one is physical disruption. So when there is a disaster, let's say flood, cyclone, or as uh, you know, my case study is focused on cyclone, most of the time you would find there's a power cut. And these days we tend to use mobile, internet, television. When there is a power cut, you are not able to communicate. So that's number one. So when there's a massive physical disruption, there is no way that the central government or the state government could pass on that core information to the primary responders, so they will not be able to do it. Number two is hierarchy. Sometimes what happens, the core information is generated in time. You know, but the hierarchy, because the disaster management system is so hierarchical, the core information gets stuck. And it gets stuck in such a bad way that it is not passed down to the responders. And the classic example is the Fukushima. You know, the tech core knew it. Um, knew it that they are sitting on the bedrock of, of earthquake and, and the technology is dated. They need to update it. They did nothing. They just sat on the bottom. And the inaction itself was a political act. So then the meltdown happened. So the hierarchy is very important. Some, so uh, another example was in, in 2012 in the Horn of Africa. FuseNet was able to generate the core information 11 months before that there is going to be a drought. Yet the government did nothing. You know? It got caught up. So that's one thing. The other thing is also accuracy of early warning information. This is very, very problematic. Sometimes, you know, the Met Office generates early warnings. And, and because the weather is so dynamic, uh, sometimes they get it wrong. And when you get those kind of information time and again, inaccurate information, people don't take, tend to take it seriously. So mistrust is, is very, very problematic. You know, even though the core information is generated, sometimes the, the Met Office and the people, as I said, the Met Office generates this information, you know, in the interface with the technology, and these are humans, and they can, they, there could be errors, and, and, and when the errors are repeated time and again, it can also cause problems. So that's the second thing. The third thing is the subjective worldviews. Um, as we, as I have mentioned, that the disaster management system is so complex, and they're all spatially segregated. They don't sit in one complex, you know. So the Met Office is probably 20 kilometers away from the Disaster Management Authority, and the block and the district levels are about 100 kilometers away from the city. So, the, so the whole disaster management system are specially segregated. You know, they are not in one complex. So they all have their own worldviews. They have their own perspectives, their own cultures, the way they want to do it. And the classic example is. The practitioners. The practitioners are largely less the disaster reduction people. All the category two and the category three people. Uh, if we look into the policies and programs, what the UN tells us that the early warning system has to be people-centered. Now, people-centered is a gender-neutral term. It doesn't tell us who these people are. Is it going to be the urban area? Is it going to be the rural area? Is it going to be the rich people, poor people? Is it going to be women? of different age, so that, that has created a lot of confusion. So the, the, because it is so gender neutral, so it is so politically neutral, so the actors interpret it in their own way. As a result, you would find, what, what I found in Orissa, that actually reducing death is not an agenda. Reducing death is also not an agenda in Africa, and reducing death is also not an agenda in Japan. You know, so who is accountable? Whose job is it to really save precious lives with a disaster? That is one problem. Number two, is the gender and disaster. So the gender and disaster people, you know, they managed to gain a lot in 2005. They managed to mainstream gender in disaster risk reduction. What it means that gender has to be included in all policies, programs, all over the world for disaster risk management. And their agendas of gender, the agendas of gender mainstreaming are three, equality, equity, and empowerment. Now these are great things, but if you really start extrapolating each component of equity, equality, equity, and empowerment, you don't see their agenda is to reduce death. 
So as a result, they have also somehow, you know, uh, managed to have an oversight of reducing debt. And because all these people are working in the domain of disaster risk reduction, they have really subjective views. Their views are so different that it's sometimes often difficult to bring them together. You know, so as a result, this whole system uh, works in a different way, in different contexts, there are cultural angles and so on and so forth. Okay, so what I will do now, so I will try to now showcase uh, the advantage of systems failure in the context of OBISA. Now this was my second slide, and I will quickly talk you through that my focus will be on the, these two cyclones, 1999 and 2013. Let's see, what does the systems failure tell us when you try to analyze this? But prior to that, let me just very quickly tell you that the field work I did it from May 2013 to July 2014. I was able to interview quite a few of uh, those category two people. I uh, interviewed the revenue and disaster manager and department there, but I interviewed the disaster manager actually. Then in special relief organization, I interviewed the deputy relief commissioner. Or in such state disaster management authority, I interviewed the manager there. District disaster management authority, I was able to interview three district emergency officers. And in the Indian Meteorology Department, I was able to interview the director. And then I interviewed several NGOs. And they were Action Aid and uh, Harbian began. So they are national NGOs who are currently working for disaster restructuring activities. So, yes, so these are the three components. And uh, this is what happened. So, in Super Cyclone 1999, as I said, why there were 10,000 people. And these are some of the things that I found out from, the, from, from my seven elite interviews that actually there was no coordination between the actors and organization. And also the core information was available only 48 hours ago. So it was so short. The, the time was very short. So the government was not able to interact with anybody. Okay, number three, Orissa Relief Court was activated. Now Orissa Relief Court, uh, either they inherited from the, uh, from, the, uh, from, from the British and they did not manage to update it. So they never used that policy before. It was only after the cyclone they activated it. So the disaster response system was very, very reactionary. So it wasn't proactive. Number two, no authority to, uh, number four, no authority to monitor relief and rescue. There was absolutely nothing. There was a chaos, total chaos. They could not do anything, you know? Uh, and also, they did come up with some relief and all, but they were looted. Uh, the, the, the relief did not reach the people. And then also, there was absolutely no plan or any plan. In terms of communication, the early warning system was really, really underdeveloped. People were only able to talk with each other through telephone, but there was a power cut. You know, there was no power from, for, for a month or so, uh, you could see. So the communication was very poor. Early warning system, as I said, was very underdeveloped. They were not able to generate that core information. They were able to do it only 48 hours ago. And then the communication system uh, to disseminate information and warnings was underdeveloped. People did not have mobile phones in those days. There were no ham radios. Television wasn't working. So people really didn't receive the information. There's a cyclone coming. And, and lastly, limited forecast technology to generate poor information. Um, Orissa, as I said, Orissa is a small and poor state. They did not have any early warning system. They were able to receive the early warnings from a neighboring state, from West Congo. You know, so they did not have any mechanism to generate their own own poor information. Uh, that's in terms of worldview, the worldview was very complacent and conservative. The government did provide some early warning system, but nobody took it. Nobody took it seriously. So we will be able to uh, finish it. Uh, finish it okay. So and then and, and there was no goal set, and the goal to reduce death was not set because there was no political leadership. The chief minister was Giridhar Gamang at the time. He just totally, you know, he just could not rise up to the situation. And uh, he was, um, he had to, he was deposed and uh, he was from Congress, Indian Congress party. And uh, after 99, Congress party was totally uh, lost and they never managed to come back to Orissa again. And, and, and uh, lastly, a fatalistic mindset. So people really didn't take it seriously. Lastly, in terms of cyclone falling, we could see the difference. So according to the INT director, Indian Metrology Department, the, the coordination was excellent. Excellent between different actors and organizations. And they were also able to generate the core information 96 hours before it was four days. And that four days gave them the opportunity to really evacuate more than one million people. And I'll show you in the next slide. I think we're running short of time. Okay. 
very quickly you can see you know that communication systems just it developed so fast and these different channels of communications help to pass out the information about the cyclone fully. And lastly, in terms of the wall views, I just want to focus on this goal. Actually, the Chief Minister, Navin Patnaik, was able to set a goal, and it was called Mission Statement. And the goal was zero casualty at any cost. And this message was passed on from the top to the bottom. And so when I interviewed the, the category two and category one, they were able to tell me, this is not my, you know, this, this, this quotation is uh, from the respondents, and they said, our chief minister told us to reduce death, and we did anything, whatever we could, to reduce death. And as a result, you know, as I said, only 86 people died. So this is the mission statement. I just copied and pasted. You know, it was in a box. Uh, the red bits are the most important one, but I have already explained about the zero, zero casualty. But that, yeah, so what was the outcome? Only 86 people died. The government was able to evacuate more than 1.2 million from 18 coastal districts. And in, our, in my sample district, you know, they evacuated more than 114,000. And uh, this evacuation operation is considered to be one of the largest operations in India in 23 years. And as you could see, now Orissa is now being presented as a model for India. And the director of UNI is still praised for his son, saying that this is actually very impressive and we should take Orissa as a case study. And Orissa also received several awards. So finally, this is my last slide. So, <clears throat> what lessons can be learned from systems failure? What systems failure um, offers is that we can actually rectify the human built systems, and those systems can be rectified by aligning the systems, by aligning different actors and organizations to come together and, and, um, and get into the job of reducing death. And also, currently, the disaster management system is not understood as a socio technical manager, disaster management system. Because when we start taking disaster management as a socio-technical system where humans and technology work in interface, that will bring a different kind of perspective in terms of our plans, policies, and even theory, actually. Thirdly, you know, um, the role of political leadership is somehow not acknowledged. It is only in 2015 the Sendai framework is telling that the political leadership play a key role. And Orissa gives a great example how the chief minister was able to come up with the mission statement, reduce death. And the whole disaster management system came behind them and they were able to do that. And lastly, uh, if we take the complex perspective, what will happen, the focus will move from the risk, from vulnerability people to the actors and organizations. So you know the spotlight will move rather than only focusing on the community. So then we will be able to tell where the gaps are in actors and amongst the organizations. And then we'll be able to come up what kind of knowledge, what kind of training, what kind of skills that we would need to improve the, uh, the skills and expertise of the respondents. Uh, and in doing so, we'll be able to probably make the system more efficient and also probably make the system more accountable. As I said, the system is not accountable at, the, at this point of time. And lastly, uh, the case of Orissa tells us that, you know, um, with the, if we are able to embrace disaster management as a socio-technical disaster management, and also um, if we are able to incorporate political leadership, and also cultural disaster preparedness that Orissa has been able to do it since 1999, there is a hope, there is a hope for developing countries, uh, hope for resource poor context uh, in, in, in reducing death. Yeah, that's it, thank you very much. Uh, there's a small article that came out last year, as I said, I'm currently, you know, my, my book is under review, um, and yes.